Problem three, let's step this up a notch. Lest you think all combined gas law problems necessitate starting conditions that define the standard cubic foot, i.e. atmospheric conditions at 68 degrees Fahrenheit, consider a different initial state. You recall the gas laws are ratios of four properties. As long as you account for absolutes, given three knowns, you should be able to solve for the fourth unknown given any starting state. This problem is a little tricky, so let's tackle it in stages. Consider a pneumatic cylinder with the following dimensions. Cap diameter 4.5 inches, a rod diameter of 2.25 inches, and a travel length of 16 inches. Part 1. Determine the pressure necessary to fully lift a 2,000 pound weight when oriented in the following fashion. You'll note in this orientation, lifting the weight makes use of the full cap end area. Part 2. At full extension, the valve is moved to the closed position and an additional 800 pounds is stacked on top. What's the cylinder do? Given air is compressible, we might expect this additional weight to compress the cylinder and thus change its extension length. Solve for this length. Again, assume this occurs at constant temperature. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. This is again a Boyle's Law problem which relates pressure and volume at constant temperature. First, we'll get to determine the initial pressure and the volume conditions. We need to make use of Pascal's Law. You do remember Pascal's Law, don't you? The cap has an area of roughly 15.9 square inches. An application of Pascal's Law demonstrates that a pressure of roughly 125.8 psi should be sufficient to lift the 2,000 pound object. Lastly, at full extension, the volume of the cap end is roughly 254.5 cubic inches. We now have our initial pressure and our initial volume conditions. When the valve moves to the closed position, we have a known volume of pressurized air trapped in the cap end of the cylinder. When 800 more pounds is stacked on top, force increases, pressure increases, and volume should decrease. Let's solve for the increased pressure. The increased force still acts on an area of roughly 15.9 square inches. An application of Pascal's Law demonstrates the cap end experiences increased pressure of roughly 176.1 psi. Let's set up the Boyle's Law relationship. P1 times V1 equals P2 times V2. We know P1 and V1 and P2, we need to solve for unknown volume V2. An algebraic manipulation of Boyle's Law solving for unknown volume V2 suggests that unknown volume equals P1 times V1 divided by P2. Now before you wrongheadedly substitute P1 and P2 as presently constituted into this equation, you need to convert them to the absolute scale. 125.8 psi gauge is equivalent to 140.5 psi absolute, and 176.1 psi gauge is equivalent to 190.8 psi absolute. Substituting these values into the algebraic manipulation of Boyle's Law demonstrates that V2 will be compressed into a volume of 187.4 cubic inches, the additional force having compressed the initial volume into a smaller size. Now what? We know the area and the volume of the cylinder, we just need to solve for height. Volume of a cylinder is area times height. An algebraic manipulation of this formula, solved for unknown height, demonstrates unknown height is equal to volume over area. Substituting in our given values demonstrates the cylinder handling this increased load only extends roughly 11.8 inches. This problem really illustrates one of the features of pneumatics, that of compressibility. Whereas the incompressible nature of oil-based hydraulics are rigid and solid, the spongy nature of a pressurized air means a pneumatic system can act like a shock absorber. Okay, next problem. Let's you think all combined gas laws necessitate US customary units, consider this scenario employing metric units. You note the combined gas laws are ratios. As long as you remain consistent and account for absolutes, you can use whatever units you wish. Let's say someone rapidly charges up a rubber bladder to a specified pressure so it occupies 3 liters of volume. In the act of compression, the bladder reaches an elevated temperature of 32 degrees Celsius, warmed to the touch on the Celsius scale, then it's set outside on a 10 degrees Celsius day, a cool but not cold temperature using the Celsius scale. Let's say the pressure inside the bladder remains constant. Once the bladder cools back down to 10 degrees Celsius, what size is it in units of liters? By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results.
This is clearly a Charles Law problem, which relates volume and temperature at constant pressure. Given pressure remains the same, and the bladder cools from 32 degrees Celsius to 10 degrees Celsius, you might expect it to shrink. Let's see if this is the case. First, we need to convert the relative temperatures in the Celsius scale to absolutes using Kelvin. 32 degrees Celsius is equivalent to 305.2 degrees Kelvin. 10 degrees Celsius is equivalent to 283.2 degrees Kelvin. Charles' law states V1 divided by T1 equals V2 divided by T2. We know V1, T1, and T2, we need to solve for V2. An algebraic manipulation of the Charles' law formula suggests that unknown V2 is equal to V1 divided by T1 times T2. Substituting our given values demonstrates V2 has dropped to roughly 2.8 liters. Before we move on to our final illustrated example, I'd like to take a moment to remind the viewer that the three gas laws, Boyle's law, Charles' law, and Gila Sox can be combined, hence the name, into one gas law, such that P1 times V1 divided by T1 equals P2 times V2 divided by T2. The three laws themselves are simply variations of this single formula where one property is held constant. In the case of Boyle's law, T1 equals T2, such that P1 times V1 equals P2 times V2. In Charles' law, P1 equals P2, such that V1 divided by T1 equals V2 divided by T2. In Guy Lussac's law, V1 equals V2, such that P1 divided by T1 equals P2 divided by T2. If you do have a scenario in which you know all five properties of an ideal gas, one can easily solve for the sixth unknown using the larger combined gas formula. I don't really intend to go to this length of computational difficulty with these illustrated examples. However, it is worth a moment of our time to at least briefly examine one classic application of this multivariable phenomenon, that of charging a gas accumulator in a fluid power system. Before we get to this application, allow me to briefly refresh isotherms. You recall from the combined gas lecture, one can plot pressure versus volume at constant temperatures, i.e. Boyle's law, on a plot that looks something like this. At temperature T1, a quantity of gas occupies a certain volume and exerts a specific pressure. Maintaining temperature constant, if we reduce the volume, pressure increases as one might expect. Using the same chart, we can also plot the pressure and volume relationships at different temperatures. For example, at increased temperature T2, where again T2 is greater than T1, pressure and volume might be related in the following fashion. As previously, at constant temperature T2, a quantity of gas occupies a certain volume and exerts a specific pressure. Maintaining temperature at T2, if we reduce the volume, pressure increases as we might expect. No surprises here. These isotherms also simultaneously illustrate Charles and Guy Lussac's law. At constant pressure, i.e. Charles' law, a quantity of gas at temperature 1 occupies a certain volume. If we increase temperature to T2, volume increases as we might expect. Similarly, at constant volume, i.e. Guy Lussac's law, a quantity of gas at T1 exerts a certain pressure. If we increase temperature to T2, that same volume of gas exerts more pressure as we might expect. Real world scenarios sometimes involve changes in all three variables. Again, the classic example being charging a pneumatic accumulator in a fluid power system, the intended purpose of this digression. As Charles' law so nicely illustrates, changes in temperature result in changes in volume as do changes in volume result in changes in temperature. Rapid compression is often associated with a temperature rise. This is why a compressor room is often so warm. In contrast, rapid expansion is often associated with a temperature drop. This is why dump valves often freeze shut. In a perfect world, accumulators should be charged and discharged slowly enough such that any temperature change associated with compression or expansion is dissipated to the environment and temperature remains constant. In such isothermal events, i.e. constant temperature events, one would simply follow the given temperature isotherm, let's say T1, and as volume is decreased, pressure predictably increases. The real world isn't always that simple. Consider a more realistic rapid adiabatic compression event, where the act of reducing the volume without dissipating the heat of compression not only increases the pressure, but also shifts from the lower T1 isotherm to the higher T2 isotherm. 
the compression or reduction in volume has resulted in both a pressure and a temperature increase. Both these observations keeping in spirit with Boyle's and Charles law. This is a pretty self-explanatory phenomenon for most technically inclined individuals. What may not be so readily apparent is that the temperature rise associated with compression is only temporary in nature. Eventually, whatever you pressurize is going to cool back down to environmental conditions. Right? It's going to drop back down to T1. If you do this in a constant volume fashion, i.e. in the manner of Gilu socks, that same volume now exerts less pressure at a reduced temperature. This is why you might charge up an accumulator to a specified pressure, only to come back after it's cooled down to find pressure has decreased. Even more complex, if volume isn't being held constant, you might move from T2 to T1 as the gas cools in this fashion and observe not only a drop in pressure, but also a reduction in volume for the same quantity of gas. In summary, there's a lot going on with pressure, volume, and temperature. Pressure at the end of a rapid adiabatic charge is not what you're going to get once the device cools back down to the external environment. All right, last problem. This one's pretty easy since you're ugly and I take pity upon you. Consider a rigid gas cylinder charged up to a pressure of 70 PSI in a 70 degree Fahrenheit facility that's being sent out to a remote job site with notoriously cold weather conditions. How cold can this cylinder get so pressure doesn't fall below 60 PSI? By all means, Pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. Given this is a rigid cylinder and volume should remain constant, this is another setup for a perfect Gila Sox problem, which relates pressure and temperature at constant volume. We first need to convert temperatures in the relative Fahrenheit scale to absolute using Rankine and pressure engaged absolute. 70 degrees Fahrenheit is roughly equivalent to 529.7 degrees Rankine. 70 PSI gauge is equivalent to 84.7 PSI absolute and 60 PSI gauge is equivalent to 74.7 PSI absolute. Gilles Sock's law states that P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. We know P1, T1, and P2. We need to solve for T2. Using a fancy inversion at the start, an algebraic manipulation of Gilles Sock's law suggests that unknown T2 is equal to T1 over P1 times P2. Substituting in our given values demonstrates T2 is roughly 467.2 degrees Rankine which is roughly equivalent to 7.5 degrees Fahrenheit, below freezing but entirely expected in the Great Plains in the winter, even on a nice day. Ask me how I know. All right, that's about it for today. In conclusion, this lecture took a look at illustrated examples and practical applications of Boyle's, Charles, and Gila Socks, the combined gas laws. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.